Shalom, my friends. It has been a little while since we last spoke. But in today's video, as you can see, we are going to be discussing, are we living in the last days? Because indeed we are. So I'm going to be given scriptures to prove to us, to the doubters, that we are definitely living in the last days, what the Bible calls the most important time of all the ages. Because we're going to be seeing the return of the Son of Man. We're going to be seeing all types of great deception like we're seeing already. We're going to be seeing the coming of the man of perdition, the lawless one. So there's going to be a lot of things happening in these last days. So let's just jump right on in it and let's start getting into it and proving to us that we are indeed in the last days. Let's take a look at Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 3. Because in 2 Timothy chapter 3, it gives us some very informative information about what Yahuwah showed Timothy about what would be going on in the last days, right? So let's dive in on that. So it says, but know this, that in the last days, hard times shall come, for men will be lovers of money. So right off the bat, Yahuwah is letting us know that men will be lovers of money. And you know, we see this common dogma today about how we got to get money, screw everything, we got to work hard to get money. And if you don't know, the scriptures tell us that that the that money is the root of all evil because it persuades the hearts of men and women to do very lawless things just to get that next dollar bill. So we have to be very careful when we're trying to get money. Of course, we need money to survive. And stuff like that but you can't be like these rich folks over here who just are greedy and greedy and want more and more money we have to be better than that you have to be way smarter than that and know that money is not the end-all be-all our destination is getting into that kingdom that is our end game when we're thinking about getting money all right and a lot of people don't understand is that Yah tests people by giving them riches he wants to see when you get if I give you riches are you gonna go out and help people with the money I gave you or are you gonna go out there and be selfish and not help people so this is a real test here are you gonna fail that test sometimes God won't give you money because he knows that you're gonna fail that test because he knows that you're gonna let money get into your heart and to deceive you and you're gonna get caught up in the lavish life start going to parties, start getting drunk, start doing all these drugs because now you have the money to do it. And you know, once you have the money to do something, it's very hard to break it because you just, if you're rich, a lot of rich people talk about how it was very, it's very hard for them to get off of drugs because they have the money to go out and keep getting it. So the temptation is always there. And it's like, oh, it don't mean nothing to me because I have money. So I can always go out there and spend it. I'm rich, so I will, I will always be able to have as many amount of drugs as I want to. I'll always be able to get as drunk as I want to. I know that women women will always be flocking to me, wanting to do all type of um, all type of sexual acts, sexual deeds to make me happy just because I'm rich. Okay, so we have to be very careful of that money thing. And and continuing on. It also says in verse 2 that men will become lovers of self. So when we see this, we know that this is definitely going on today. A lot of people don't care about other people. The heart of many has waxed cold. People are trying to only worry about themselves. I remember my um my mom was talking about my mom was talking about when she was a young woman how when she was a kid, not a young woman, when she was a kid it growing up in the 60s, how all the neighbors knew each other and the, and how one time um, my um, uh, my na one of my mom's neighbors saw my mom's brother smoking a cigarette. And she, and that neighbor actually told her father about what she saw and everything. So that's something you definitely don't see today where you have your neighbors looking out for one another, where you can um, 
where you can safely know that your kid will walk around the corner and he won't be harassed, he won't get snatched up. Because, you know, today we're living in very crazy times. You can't you can't even allow your kid to walk to the corner, of the to the street corner by himself because someone will come and snatch him up like that. That's the type of days we're living in. And the whole selfie movement where people are trying to take selfies, trying to take pictures of themselves, I believe that that line is also definitely pertaining to this whole selfie movement. All right. So we learned that in the end time, people will become lovers of self, lovers of money, bolsters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, thankless, wrongdoers, okay? It says unloving. All this is going on in the last days. People will be unloving. People don't want to help out a homeless person. They look at them as dirty and filthy, okay? People become unloving, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, fierce, haters of good, betrayers, reckless, puffed up, right? Look at this, puffed up, bolsters and all that. Lovers of self, I mean, sorry, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of Elohim. And when I think about that the verse there where this says lovers of pleasure, more we'll love pleasure more than we'll love Elohim. I think about how today really does conform to the pleasures and to the wicked desires of people. Like people eat and stuff their faces because the food's there. They love the way food, for example, makes them feel. People today, people today love having sex with multiple women because they want to try out the different cookies. Yeah, people want to try out the different cookies. And and people want to get into this sinful life because it feels good. And people just don't know the path that this is leading you down. People don't know at the end of the road, this is going to cause your soul to be thrown into hell. The price for all these wicked pleasures and wicked sins, the price is your soul. And is that really worth it? Because think about that. Um, even if you're an old man, even if you live to be an old man, how does it profit? A, how does it profit you to be living a sinful life all your days? Say you make it to a hundred years old. Even though you may make it to a hundred years old, that does not count at all. That does not weigh bigger than eternity of salvation and living with the Messiah, living in God's kingdom in New Jerusalem. Watching the earth re be re watching the earth and the heavens be restored to its former greatness and even better. How does that compare to that? Because you because you wanted to live a life where you wanted to have multiple sex partners, you wanted to have all these different women, you wanted to do this and that. How does that help you in the end when at the end of the day you're going to lose your life and not lose your life as in die, but lose your life as in the second death, going into the pit. There's a scripture that says that, what the, excuse me, there's a scripture that says, how does it profit a man to gain the whole world when at the end of the day, he's going to end up in hell or that he's going to lose his life. So that scripture is in there because God is asking, what does it mean that you run the entire world? What does it mean that you own everything? When at the end of the day, when you die, you're going into the pit. And it really doesn't, it doesn't, really doesn't profit you in these days and age. Because Adam and everybody up until the great flood in the antediluvian age was living a max, a max um, 969 years. The oldest person in recorded in Bible history is lived to be 969. So compare that 969 years to the average life expectancy of men and women, which is somewhere between 70 and 100 years old. So that definitely doesn't compare. And even then, even if we were still living these long lives of getting up to a maximum of 969 years, living that life, that still does not, that still does not make your soul that still does not make up for the time you would end up spending in hell because you wanted to live a sinful life. 
it just doesn't equate to it. And another one of these pleasures, we see how this movement of smoking weed is um, in big effect, getting high, all these pleasures that all these wicked pleasures just to make your flesh feel good, the desires of the flesh, which we'll end up reading too. So I just definitely think about how this world is definitely participating in your sin. And the global elite, they know this. They know all this stuff. So that's why, because they have made a pact with the devil and they have all come together to come against his, to, to come against the Messiah, Yahushua, Yahushua. So we have to remember that we cannot get caught up in these pleasures because it is, at the end of the day, your downfall. So we can't get caught up in all this stuff. So we got to come out of all these wicked pleasure desires, going to the club just to have one night stands with a girl, getting smoking weed, doing shrooms, doing acid, DMT, um, if you're crazy enough to do uh, what's that drug called? Ayahuasca. All this stuff. Getting drunk. Getting lit. And all this. And this is. And and I love this next verse right here. Because this just shows exactly what is what people are doing today. And remember, these are all end time prophecies. So in verse 5, continuing on, it says, Having a form of reverence, but denying its power. And turn away from these. So in other words, it is saying having a form of godliness, but denying its power. So this is where we get this whole idea where we can think that we can party on Saturday night, Sunday morning, coming in and doing what and pretending to be holy. We cannot walk like that because the word of God is very clear. We need to be treating every day. Like it's a holy day. We can't be coming Friday night, coming Saturday night, hitting the clubs, twerking it, doing all this crazy stuff, and then trying to be holy on Sunday for one day, and then trying to ask God for forgiveness and all this stuff. Some of you, some of the people don't even realize that true repentance is you stopping your wicked deeds altogether. Because the Messiah, besides um, coming up, coming back to restore Israel, his people, besides that, his other goal is to destroy the works of the lawless one. And the, to destroying the works of the lawless one does definitely mean taking down the establishment of clubs, nightclubs, bars, and all this stuff. Because the scriptures tell you, to stay away from wild parties. It literally says that in the scriptures. Maybe I'll read that a little bit later. But the scriptures do tell you to stay away from wild parties. So when you go into the club and you dancing and screaming Saturday night, the music is super loud where you can't hear anything. People getting drunk, um, dancing crazy on the dance floor and all that stuff. That consider that is considered wild party. You see the girls twerking on all the guys. That is definitely considered a wild party and i like this little meme where it says so you're telling me you catch the holy ghost in church every sunday morning but you twerk and get drunk as hell in the club every saturday night that is very blasphemous right there it says you cannot walk you can't walk with god holding holding hands with the devil hallelujah on that one you cannot do both you cannot Serve two masters. You cannot serve two masters. You cannot be trying to do the works of the devil and then also trying to redact back and do God's will at the same time. It just don't work like that. You either on one team or the other team. And if you ain't keeping all of God's commandments, all of Elohim's commandments, Yahuwah's commandments, hallelujah, you are not with him. You are on the side of Satan. Okay? And just like Satan... You shall die and go into hell, too, if you cannot get rid of these deeds. We have to stop this, all right? So next, so next, another sign of the end times Timothy has seen by Yahuwah. It says that, it says that, um, it says from among them, oh, wait.
All right, my bad. All right, so it says also continuing on from in verse 6. From among them are those who creep into households and captivate silly women loaded down with sins, led away by various lusts. Now, what is that talking about? So we just got done reading how men and women in the last days will have a form of godliness, but denying its power. So people trying to go to church and saying, oh, because I'm a Christian, oh, because I believe in Jesus Christ, I'm already forgiven for my sins, and I can just continue doing my sins, and the Messiah is just going to forgive me. No, no, no. The Messiah came and gave us clarification on his word so that we would stop our sins and turn to him and do his commandments with all reverence, with all fear, and with all respect in Yahuwah, okay? He didn't give us his word. He didn't come back to save people who are still in their sins and know, and definitely people who are still in their sins and know better, okay? You have to stop your sins. So what do, they, what do they mean in verse 6 when it says, From among them are those who creep into households and captivate silly women loaded down with sins, led away by various lusts. Because we are seeing in the last days how women are getting played by men. Can you believe that? Women getting played by men is in the scriptures. Because this hasn't happened before. This was not going on in the 60s, 70s, and if it was, it definitely isn't going on to the height that it is going on today. Because, you know, a lot of women, they say, they always talk about, oh, I'm tired of men playing me. I'm tired of men saying whatever they need to say just to get into my pants. Well, woman, listen closely. This is why Yahuwah calls them silly women loaded down with sins. Because if you really, listen up, women, if you really want a man to respect you, you got to respect yourself. At the end of the day, most the majority of men do not want a used up woman. We don't like we don't like um, used shoes. We like our shoes brand spanking new out the box. Meaning, at the end of the day, even though a lot of men would sleep with that girl, sleep with that girl, it really is because they're easy. But at the end of the day, we want that woman who is a woman who we can say is our wife, who we can say has not had a lot of partners, okay? If you're do if you if you're known if you're a woman that's known for having sex with multiple guys, um having known for doing all type of sexual acts to play to please men or something like that, men will flock to you because they want to try the cookies too. But they won't take you seriously. They won't put a ring on your finger because of your past. So women if you really want a man to respect you, you need to respect yourself. In other words, you need to save yourself for the right man. That is literally going to cut out a lot of nonsense. If every woman committed, if every woman committed to saving themselves until marriage, men would have no choice but be forced to act right. Okay? So this would cause women to have that same respect as that as has always been had on them until these until these days and that will cause men to stay in line too because if every woman was committing to that we would know that okay we can't get this woman by just telling her this and that by showing her tons of money we know that she this is a woman of class that I'm going to have to be a respectful gentleman she's going to she's going to actually be looking at me to see if I'm the type of man that will take care of my children that would love love my wife, that stuff. So we need to really realize that a lot of this stuff, it can be avoided simply if women just commit to saving themselves from marriage and really commit to, I'm not going to be played by these men. So we got to get rid of this whole 90 day rule thing. It needs to be, the rule needs to be when he puts a ring on your finger rule. That's the rule that needs to be not no 90 days rule or I'm going to wait two weeks or I'm going to wait a month because at the end of the day, what if that relationship don't work out? If a guy really wants to have sex with you and he's just waiting for you to give in, he'll wait a long time. He'll wait the he'll wait that nine days rule, whatever, especially if you like real beautiful, have a big old booty, have a big rack and all that stuff, nice juicy lips. 
um, curves. He'll he'll wait it out. But he won't wait it out if he if he really doesn't like your personality. There's only he won't wait it out if he knows that you're a woman that's gonna wait, make him wait until marriage. If he is a bad man, if he is um, just scum, you know, just trying to have sex with anything that walks, he will not be able to wait it out. But if he's a man that really loves you and respects you, he's gonna wait it out because. During that time, he'll be getting to know you, you'll be getting to know him, and you'll know his family, and you'll see where background he comes from, and you'll know if this is the right man for you. He'll know if you are the right woman for him. A real man will be able to wait out until marriage. A boy will be like, nah, I'm just going to go and get the next girl that will, if that's going to have sex with me. And then, and then both of them can end up in the pit. But women, you have to have respect for yourselves. And this is exactly what this scripture is talking about, how women in the last days will be sitting around here getting played because they are listening to the double tongue of that men have just to get into your pants, okay? So women, you got to be smarter than that. I really cannot stand it when I see a good woman with the wrong guy because, oh, he's cool. He has tattoos. Oh, he's had sex with multiple women and I want a man with experience. You realize... If you never had sex and and he's never had sex, both of you won't know what is considered good sex. It's only we talk about, I want a man who has experience because everyone is so tainted and has tried different cookies that it's just hard to just settle down because now you have it in your mind like, oh, this person doesn't, doesn't have sex as good as the last person. But if you're all virgins, if everybody's a virgin, you won't know what is good sex or bad sex because I'm sure when when um you broke your virginity, I'm sure that the sex was good up until you started having sex with other people who had more experience, who were living more of a sinful life, okay? So the real goal is, the way God intended it is for a man and a woman who are husband and wife to enjoy each other. And you're supposed to be getting better at that stuff as a husband and wife, you're not supposed to be getting better at that stuff with your boyfriend, your girlfriend. It's only supposed to be a one-time thing, okay? It's only supposed to be a one-time thing, meaning you're only supposed to break that virginity one time, and that's with your husband, the man you know that's going to be your husband, the woman you know that's going to be your wife. You're not supposed to be trying the chocolate chip cookies, the double chocolate chip cookies, the sugar cookies, okay? None of that stuff, the peanut butter and all that. You're only supposed to know one type of cookie, which is your husband or your wife. All right, so let's continue on. So question, um, verse 6 says, so I'll read that together. It says, from among them are those who creep into households and captivate silly women loaded down with sins, led away by various lusts, All, always, always learning and never being able to come to the knowledge of truth. That's talking about all the classes we go to. We go to college to learn this and that, but yet we don't take any time to read the holy word of God, the holy inspired word of Elohim himself, the only thing that is going to get you to that path of life, all right? The only thing that's going to get you into the kingdom. We're learning about everything else except for how to get into heaven, all right? So <clears throat> it says, and as... It says, also learning and never being able to come to the knowledge of truth. And as Yohane and Memorame oppose Mose, so do these also oppose the truth. Men of corrupt minds found worthless concerning the belief. But they shall not go on further, for their folly shall be obvious to all, as also that of those men became. So in other words, God is saying that, when you see these men and women loaded down with lust and sin, you're going to know. When Once you come into the knowledge of God, it's going to be very obvious to discern and to sift through who is a sinner, who is a person trying to do right by God, and who's trying to keep his commandments. Because it's very obvious to me. So you know those people that are hitting the club and all that stuff. You know that man who you see has multiple sex partners, multiple women, and the silly women that get caught up with these men because oh he looks good oh because his oh because he has 
him. He does really good sex. Oh, he has lots of money and that stuff. You know who these people are that are that are just so deceived. And and Yahuwah says that they that men of corrupt minds found worthless in their belief, but they shall not go further. They ain't getting into the kingdom. So verse 10 says, but you closely followed my teaching, the way of life, the purpose, the belief, the patience, the love, the endurance, the perse the persecutions, the suffering, which came to me at Antioch. Um, this is a place in um, Greece that came to me in Antioch at Ekron and at Lustria. What persecutions I bore yet out of them. All the Adam delivered me. So he's saying, so Timothy is saying that, he's saying that if, you, if you're walking with the Messiah, you're going to go through persecutions. You're going to have to deal with people who are saying, oh, the word of God ain't right. Oh, this ain't that. The word of God is just um, just um, corrupted words written by people who want to control men. That stuff. All right. So we're going to be dealing with many persecutions. And some of them might even cost you your life, but you have to not love your life unto death. And indeed, all those wanting to live reverently in Messiah, Yahushua, shall be persecuted. So in the next verse, it says that if we want to live the right life, we're going to get persecuted. Because remember, this world is in the hands of the lawless one, the hands of the devil, okay? The God's, Yahuwah's kingdom is not here yet, but it is quickly coming. It is high tide for some for some, um, it is high tide for, what's the word I'm looking for? For some judgment. There you go. It is high tide for some judgment. And we are right on the horizon of judgment. But even, but it says, but evil men and imposters shall go on to the worst, leading astray and lead and being led astray. But you stay in what you have learned and trusted, having known from who you have learned, and that from a child you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for deliverance through belief in Messiah Yahushua. So Yahuwah is saying, once you learn this stuff, don't let it go. Hold on, because many, many evil doctrines, many doctrines of the devil are out today to persuade you into the way of wickedness. So we have to hold on tightly to the word of Yahuwah. Hallelujah. We have to hold on tightly to the word of Yahuwah. And we cannot be as a boat twisting in the wind, going here, going there. We have to be firm. We have to be on the right path of light. Okay? We cannot be teeter-tottering between doing right by God, between sinning. Okay? We have to be unmovable, like the foundations of heaven. All right? <clears throat> So also, this is a very important line here in verse 16. It says, all scripture, all scripture is breathed by Elohim and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for straightening, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of Elohim might be fitted, equipped for every good work. Now, why do I say that verse is very important there? Because remember, this is talking about last days, all of Timothy Second Timothy chapter three is last time prophecy. So we see in the last day, excuse me, we see in the last days how many scribes who have translated the doctrines of Yahuwah say, for example, oh, the book of Jubilees, that's not um, canonical scripture. The book of Jasher, that's not canonical scripture. Book of Enoch. The, uh, the Apocalypse of Elijah, the Apocalypse of Daniel, the life of Adam and Eve, the first two books of Adam and Eve, all this stuff, right? These scribes really do want to say that, oh, that, oh, that's not the correct scriptures. We can't look at that. We have to stay um, loyal to the, to the King James Bible. We can't look at the Maccabees, none of that stuff, right? But no, no, no. That is not what Yahuwah just said. He said, all scripture is breathed upon and all scripture is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for straightening, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of Elohim might be fitted, equipped for every good work, right? So Yahuwah looked down from the heavens, and not even then, before Yahuwah created anything, 
he knew that this day was going to come where people say that, oh, that these scriptures aren't important. But yeah, when you sit and read them, you see how they fit perfectly with the word of God. And you can see in the Bible, for example, the book of Enoch, we can see in the Bible, the King James Bible, where the Bible prophets are using the book of King of the book of Enoch. We see where the Messiah is quoting scriptures from the book of Enoch. And you're telling me that the book of Enoch isn't canonical when you have the Messiah himself quoting things from the book of Enoch? And by the way, Genesis 6 doesn't, you can't get the full story in Genesis 6 without the book of Enoch, okay? So things like that. And we see in the scriptures as well where the book of Jubilees and Jasher is mentioned by, um, by for example, Joshua, right? We see where, where they're reading these books, where it literally addresses these books in the Bible. But yet, when you scroll through your Bible, the book of Jubilees and Jasher is not there. So we got to get out of this thing about, oh, this book isn't canonical. This book isn't right. That book is wrong. We can't look at that because that's not inspired by God's word. But yet here in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17, Elohim himself is letting us know that all scripture is breathed upon and can be used for instruction so that you may be fitted, um, so that you may be fitted, um, be fitted and equipped for every good work, okay? So if you're new to this walk, don't believe the, all the hype that, oh, this isn't canonical, this isn't everything, okay? Because a lot of people don't know is that in 1611, when the King James Bible first came out, it had 80 books in it. It had the Maccabees, well, the entire Apocrypha, in other words. It had the entire Apocrypha, but they didn't like what there was in there because it holds some very powerful information. So they took out the Apocrypha, and now we have today our 66 books of the King James Bible. So we're seeing in we're seeing modernity, modern history, where where they're tampering with the Bible and then trying to take it out at the last second and say, oh, that's not right. That is no man's place, especially a Gentile, especially a Gentile who is not of of Hebrew Israelite seed, who is not the children of Yah, especially a Gentile has no place trying to say this scripture is right, trying to take out these books, okay? But we are living in the times of the Gentiles. But that is coming to an end. But be mindful of that stuff. So now I want to go on over to Second Peter chapter 3. Because we're going to come back. And we're going to get even more clarification about what we just read in verse 16 and 17. Okay. About all scriptures breathed upon. We're going to get even more clarification. So now let's go to Second Peter. And so. Now we're in 2 Peter chapter 3. And I think we need to really listen to this because this is real. This is real good right here. So it says in, in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 3, it says, Knowing this, that mockers shall come in the last days with mocking, walking according to their own lust. So Yahuwah is warning us that mockers were coming in the last days. And he says, where and they and they shall be saying, so I'll read that again. It says, knowing this first, that mockers shall come in the last days, in the last days with mocking, walking according to their own lust, and after and saying, Where is the promise? Where is the promise of his coming? For since the father fell asleep, all continues as from beginning of creation. Okay. So isn't that something? Isn't that something? Yahushua is letting us know that in the last days, mockers shall come. And people will be saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the father fell asleep, all of creation continue. Because right now, what that verse means when it says that since the father fell asleep, all of creation continue. That is talking about how, that is talking about <clears throat> how, People are doing their sins, right? People are being lawless. People are committing all types of sin, fornication, adultery, drunkardness, drug sorceries, right? Murders, killings, and all this stuff. But yet, it's like, where's the judgment of God? 
It's like, it's like, I just had sex with three different girls. I just had an orgy. I just did all these wicked deeds, right? But yet I don't see the hand of God coming into my life. But you must understand that Yahuwah has not forgotten. He is only giving, he's trying to give you time to repent, which, which we are about to read. So we must understand, Yah is definitely still working. He is still looking right now down from the heavens and seeing what's going on. And he is preparing. He is preparing right now for that final millisecond to hit that red button and to say, judgment is coming. Judgment is here. You must understand, once God gives the okay and he says, get him, judgment is here and it shall not tarry for one second. When it is time, it is time. And the time to repent the time to get it right is is going to be one day too late, one hour too late. The door is closed. You better go through that open door while the door is still opening. Because the way things are going right now, it is definitely looking like the door is 75% closed and it's just a crack left before God um, closes the door all the way and, and puts on the and puts that lock on it and puts the deadbolt on it, and then nobody's getting through the door who hasn't already gotten through. All right? So we have to do this. It's, and then, I love this next verse. It says, for they, so the so the mockers, the atheists, the people who don't want to believe, it says, for they have chose to have this hidden from them, that the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of water and in water, by the word of Yahuwah. So when he says that little verse right there, Yahuwah is talking about how these people choose to have the word hidden from them. Because in this day and age, we have no reason to doubt the existence of Elohim because we have computers. We have, we are able to get in contact with the lost books of the Bible that have been taken out by the scribes or never added in. Okay. So we have the ability to get our hands on these books. We are living in the most tech in one of the most technologically advanced times, right? Okay? There has never been a time like this, nor shall there ever be again. So we have no excuse to not go out here and prove ourselves unto Elohim, yes? Because we have the internet, we have we are able to go to get these books, we have cars, we have all this stuff. So we can drive to the library, the libraries have these books, all this stuff. It is very easy for us to get our hands on these books. It is very easy for us to look up information and prove these things to ourselves. So this is what Yahuwah means when he says these mockers choose to have Yahuwah's greatness hidden from them. Hallelujah. All right. And it says, continuing on in verse 6, it says, through which the world at time was destroyed, being flooded by the waters. And the present heavens and the earth are treasured up by the same word being kept for fire. Okay? It says, to a day of judgment and destruction of wicked men. But beloved ones, let not this one be hidden from you. That with Yahuwah, one day is a thousand years. And a thousand years is one day. Ooh, that is powerful. So you mean to tell me when we get up there in the heavens and it is time for us to leave, that one day is a thousand years? So think about that for a second. Think about, for example, nineteen, the year 1900. We're over here looking at the year 1900, right? As a hundred years ago. As a hundred, well, sorry now, it's um 117, almost 118 years ago. But yet, if one day in heaven is a thousand years for us, do you realize that the year 1900 has only passed maybe a second ago, two seconds ago? This is how fresh this stuff is. So when we over here thinking that God is not paying attention, he's like only a few seconds went by in the last century. So we must really, really be paying attention. And that should strike a little bit of fear. And that should strike great fear. Not a little bit. That should strike great fear in your heart. Because so many things that we say, oh, that's the past. Oh, that's 60 years ago. Oh, that's 100 years ago. That's 200 years ago. 
Nobody cares about that. God has let that be. He's not worried about that. Oh, he's still worried about that. Because not even a day has passed since these things have happened. Seconds, minutes, maybe. All right? All right, so, <clears throat> and this is what I'm about to talk about. Where I talk, where, where it talks about Yahuwah is just wants us to repent. It says in verse 9, Yahuwah is not slow in regard to the promise, as some count slowness. slowness. So people saying, oh, come on, man. Um, Yahuwah is not here right now. He's so slow. He's moving so slow. But he is not slow. He just said it. He said, Yahuwah is not slow in regard to the promise, as some count slowness, but impatient, but is patient towards us, not wanting that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So so you're telling me, even though Yahuwah is seeing all this lawlessness, he is still trying to bless us. He is still on our side, hoping and praying that we are that we come to his knowledge and repent. What a merciful Elohim he is towards the people who want to keep his command. He is literally waiting for his people, for not just his people, but for Gentiles too to repent, hallelujah, what a good Elohim is he, that he is seeing all this stuff, and he is still waiting for people to repent. So you see in all this time that Yahuwah has given people, given the nation to come to repentance, we need to take advantage of this. We need to take advantage of this get in heaven quick card. Repent, stop the works of lawlessness, okay? So we need to be wise and come to this. So going on in the next verse. It says, but the day of Yahuwah shall come as a thief in the night. And why will it come as a thief in the night? Because people aren't paying attention to the times. People think that total eclipse that we just had a month ago was just, a, was just an anomaly that just so happens. You must understand that every ancient civilization, when they saw a total eclipse, they were afraid of what was about to happen next because they knew something bad was going to happen. It, it's not just something good is happening or it's just some type of random event of, oh, the sun is, the moon is just happening to pass in front of the sun. That has always been a herald of judgment, okay? So this is why Yahuwah is saying this thing is going to come as a thief in the night because people just aren't paying attention to what is going on in the earth. The distress of nations, what is going on in the heavens, all the signs that are around us. So Yahuwah is letting us know that that the that when he comes today, the day is going to be the day of Yahuwah shall come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with intense heat, and the earth and the works that are in it shall be burned up. Seeing all these are to be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be in holy behavior and reverence, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of, Yeh of Elohim, through which the heavens shall be destroyed, being lit on fire, and the elements melt with intense heat? But according to his promise, we wait for a renewed heaven and a renewed earth in which righteousness dwells. So right there, we need to be keeping the commandments of Yah because we need to be waiting for the renewed heaven for and for the renewed earth because anyone who understands the word of Yahuwah understands that this is not our final, this is not our true home. Our true home is in that new heaven and new earth where we can serve Yahuwah right, where we can see his mighty hand working where we shall will be restored to our former glory. Okay, and even better, we got to get out of this earthly desire because this is going to be destroyed. Yahuwah just said it's going to be destroyed by the, by, you know, intense heat and fire. Okay, <clears throat> so continuing on, it says, So then, beloved ones, looking forward to this, do your utmost to be found by him in peace, spotless and blemished. So knowing that this world is going to come to an end, that Yahuwah is going to roll up the heavens as a scroll and destroy it, knowing that we need to be trying to be spotless. We need to be like, we need to be trying like 
We need to be trying to be like pure red heifers, spotless without blemish, blameless. We need to be doing, we need to be the best we can. We need to be serving Yahuwah the best we can and keeping his commandments and reckon the peace and reckon and reckon the patience of our Adam as deliverance, as also our beloved brother Shaul wrote to you according to the wisdom given to him, as also in all letters speaking in, as also in all letters speaking in them concerning these, concerning these, in which some scriptures are hard to understand, which those who are untaught and are unstable twist to their own destruction, as they do also the other scriptures. Now listen to this. Listen to this. Because remember, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, we read at verse 16 and 17, how Yahuwah says, all scripture is breathed upon in such and such form, right? So here in 2 Peter, we have another addition to that, where it says that these scriptures are hard to understand, and those who are untaught twist to twist the scriptures to their own destruction as they do the other scriptures, right? So he's talking, so Kepha is talking about, which is Peter. Kepha is talking about how people in the last days are not going to be able to understand the scriptures completely and they're going to twist it to their own destruction and they're going to twist other scriptures, so other books of the Bible to their own destruction. So this is why Yahuwah is saying all scripture is breathed upon. And I got another one that goes with this one, too. So we're seeing today how we have all these rich TV pastors getting rich off the word of God, twisting it to their own destruction and all this stuff. And just not keeping the commands of God, getting getting into the ministry just to just to get rich. Like Joel Osteen being worth 50 million dollars. You have Creflo dollar sign and all these other people. All these um, all these pastors and preachers trying to get rich off the word of Yahuwah, only bringing in their own demise. So let's go ahead and keep on reading this last little bit. It says, You then, beloved ones, being forewarned, watch, lest you also fall from your own steadfastness, being led away with the delusion of the lawless. But grow in favor and knowledge of our Adam." and Savior, Yahushua HaMashiach. To him be the esteem, but to him be the esteem, both now and to a day that abides. Hallelujah. So Yahuwah is saying and letting us know that we need to keep, once we get this knowledge, once we understand the truth, we have to keep teaching ourselves. We have to keep reading the word. We have to keep making sure that we're staying on the path of righteousness. We just can't read it one day and then say, oh, I got the message and and think that you won't backslide like that. You have to keep practicing. You have to keep learning and teaching yourself. You have to keep moving forward in Yahuwah, okay? Because, because the devil is always ready. It's always ready to take what you have put in your heart and to bring you back into sin. He's always trying. Him and his minions are always trying to get to your heart and soul and to make you be lawless and to make you fall back into sin once you've cleaned yourself. It is very easy to fall into sin. Think about it like this. Think about it like this. If Adam and Eve, who was in the Garden of Eden, who literally walked with Elohim, who literally saw his face, who knows how God looks, if Satan can deceive them who are you who are you who am i to think that satan can't get me too all right we are not that holy okay we're not even us as children of israel watching this we are not even when we were in israel we're in a very fallen state okay so who are you and who am I to think that if I don't tread softly and if I don't keep pushing and if I don't keep praying, seeking Yahuwah, who am I? Who are you to think that the devil can't get you too? Who are you and who am I? Come on now. If 
if Satan could deceive the first people who walked with Elohim, who was in the garden, who saw the angels, who are the first creations, who are the first man, woman creations of Elohim, who saw his face, knew his law, who talked with him daily until they got kicked out of the garden. You think Satan can't get you? You a fool. You a fool if you think Satan can't get you. That's why you have to guard his word day and night. That's why you have to keep on reading the scriptures. And you have to keep on being self-aware of am I doing the right thing, okay? Because it is very easy for Satan to get his hands on you if you are not committing to his word. And that should really bring you up and bring you to awareness of what could happen to you. And another thing, think about this too. Remember in Revelation where it says that, you know, that the Messiah will come down and we will live for him a thousand years and then Satan will be loosed again for a time, right? The, nowhere in the scriptures does it says that the Messiah would be going back up into the heavens. The Messiah is going to be on the earth, right? We will have lived with him a thousand years and you're telling me that God is going to release Satan again and that people are still going to be able to be deceived after living with the Messiah a thousand years, after seeing his face, and he's still going to be on the earth. He ain't going nowhere. And you're telling me that Satan is still going to be able to deceive people? Come on, you would think that, oh, we living with the Messiah a thousand years. There's no way we can backtrack, right? But Satan's deceptive powers are so great and so strong that he will still be able to deceive people even after all of us are living with the Messiah a thousand years. That is crazy, right? That is crazy. So if you're thinking Satan can't get you, you better watch out because he can. He is very crafty. He can get you if you're not really, really focusing, okay? So now, let's bring that over and let's go to First Peter and let's look at chapter 1 and um, chapter 2. All right, so now let's go over to second, let's go over to chapter 1, verse 16 in Second Peter, a.k.a. Second Kepha. Because this is very important. This is all going to be going back to what I was talking about, where in the word it says that Yahuwah has breathed upon all scripture and also going on to where it says that people will come and they will twist the scriptures to their own destruction. Let's see what Second Kepha Chapter 1, verse 16 says, okay? It says, For we did not cleverly devise stories when we made known to you the power and coming of our Adam, Yahushua HaMashiach, but we're, but we're eyewitnesses of his superbness. For when, we have, for when he received respect and esteem from Yahuwah the Father, such a excellent voice came to him from the excellent esteem. This is my son, the beloved in whom I delight. And we heard this voice which came from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. And we have the and we have the prophesying word made more certain, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning stars rises in your heart. Knowing this first, this is the most important part, knowing this first, that no prophet, no prophecy of scripture, no prophecy of scripture came to be of one's own interpretation. For, pro for prophecy never came by the desire of man, but men of Elohim spoke, being moved by the Ruach HaKadosh, hallelujah, by the Holy Spirit, in other words. So this, is, I love this scripture because this really just takes them out the way. Because they are letting us know, these future generations and the people that they were talking to in their time, that no prophecy that was ever been spoken was done by their own interpretation. It was always Yahuwah who put his Holy Spirit, as Christians would call it, but the correct way is the Ruach HaKadosh, the, it has always been that Yahuwah has put the Ruach HaKadosh in these people and given men 
his own prophecy of what was going to happen. It was never man's interpretation of God. Hallelujah. It was always Yahuwah giving us his word. And then we just copied it down. Okay. So that is very important. And in um, chapter two here, it says, but there also came to be false prophets among the people as also among you. There shall be false prophets, false teachers who secretly bring in destructive heresies and deny the Adam who brought them, bringing swift destruction on themselves. And many shall follow their destructive ways because of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken. And in greed, with fabricated words, they shall use you for gain? Didn't we literally, didn't we literally just talk about these Bible prophets here that get rich off of people? This is exactly what the scripture is saying. Let's read that again. It says, but there also came to be false prophets among the people, as also among you there shall be false teachers. Who shall secretly bring in destructive heresies and deny the Adam who brought them, bringing swift destruction on themselves. And many shall follow their destructive ways, because of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. And in greed, with fabricated words, they shall use you for gain. And all these TV prophets have done just that. Use the, the word of Yahuwah for gain to become millionaires. There's even a TV show called um, the um, the um, the like the Millionaire Pastors of California, something like that, where they all living in their mansion homes, getting rich off the Word of God. So this is just definitely speaking to this day and age because this is definitely happening in today's time. We've seen all these TV prophets getting rich, um, not speaking true doctrine, speaking their own interpretation of the Word just so they can fill up their pockets and get rich because people are so foolish and think that the way into heaven is giving these pastors your money and all this stuff. That is not. They are bringing swift destruction on themselves, just like the word says. Okay, so we have to get out of this. We have to. All right. So let's continue on. And <clears throat> let's continue on. And it says, and it says, um, from of old, their judgment does not linger, and their destruction does not slumber. Okay? So God has said from a long time ago, I have had, I prepared their swift judgment for what they have done with their lying doctrines and using my words to get, um, get rich. Okay? So this is very important. So the next time you're thinking about giving all this money to the church, you need to be thinking about what can you do your family first and you need to be thinking about what how can you help people in your community first instead of giving money to the church because they are corrupt and they are using it to fill up their pockets okay so we have to be careful when you giving your 10 percent okay all right now that we clarified all that let's go over and take it to romans chapter one and i personally love romans chapter one because romans chapter one is very much Filled with a whole lot of information if you understand what it what Romans chapter 1 is saying a little personal bias of mine right there so we're going to start at Romans chapter 1 and we're going to take a gander over to verse 16 and it says for I am not ashamed of the good news of Mashiach for it is the power of Elohim for deliverance to everyone who believes to the Hebrew first and also the Greek for it, for in it the righteous, for in it the righteousness of Elohim is revealed from belief to belief, as it is, has been written. But the righteous shall live by belief. For the wrath of Elohim is revealed from heaven against all wickedness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Now, doesn't that correlate exactly to what we were just saying about how? these false pastors would come in the end times and this was going on in their day too but specifically talking about the the greatness of it in the last days which we are in so we saw we see how these false prophets would be arising and people and they'd just be teaching the word for gain 
like we see many TV pastors doing. And then this also correlates to how people twist the scriptures, because here it's talking about how people um, oppress the truth in unrighteousness, right? So let's continue on and let's get more clairvoyance of this information here. It's, it says now in verse 19, because that which is known of Elohim is manifest among them. For Elohim has manifested to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisibilities have been clearly seen, be clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, both his everlasting power and mightiness, for them to be without excuse? So you're telling me that when Yahuwah first gave man his word, that he made everything, the invisibilities, clearly seen through his word. So men, women are all without excuse. So what happened? What happened? Because we know that it is not like that. People have come up with many excuses because we know that these books have been taken out. Over 115 books of the original Hebrew scriptures have not been added to the King James Bible, or they were taken out, just like how in 1611 we learned that the original King James Bible had 80 books, which the rest of it was the Apocrypha, you know, the Book of Maccabees, um, Baruch, that stuff, Second Esdras, that, and that stuff right there. But then they took it out, and they left us with the 66 books that we have today. So let's talk about that, because Yahuwah said that when he first gave us his word, everything was made clear. But we know that a lot of scriptures have been twisted, just like we read in, in the message of Peter, who is Kepha. It says, because although they knew Elohim, they did not esteem him as Elohim, nor gave thanks, but became vain in their reasoning, and their, and their undiscerning heart was darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. So now we're hearing about a people who, when they knew Elohim, they did not, they did not um, esteem him as Elohim, nor give thanks. But they became vain in their reasoning, and undiscerning in their hearts. Their undiscerning hearts was wicked, and claiming to be wise, they became fools. Now let's see what did they do that Yahuwah said they became fools. What's what did they do? So in the next verse here, it is saying that they changed in verse 23 it says it says claiming to be wise they became fools and changed the and changed the esteem of elohim of sorry and changed the esteem of the incorruptible elohim into the likeness of an incorruptible man and birds and of four-footed beasts and of reptiles so what does that mean so we're hearing where yahuwah says that his image has been changed and and the image has been changed into the likeness of a corruptible man? What does that mean? Because last time I checked, the image that we commonly see today is of white Jesus and of all these white disciples. But let me give you a little bit of insight. Check this out. When you look at the original pictures, because... Just like the Romans had um, statues of their people, just like the Egyptians had hieroglyphs and pictures, and just like every every ancient civilization of that time did, because, you know, the original Hebrew people were in that day and age, they had pictures of how their people looked, too. And as you can see, we have a lot of black faces here. So we see how they have changed the black images into the white images that we see today. And also, this is probably why they took out the Maccabees. Because in uh, in Maccabees chapter 3, verse 48, the Hebrews talk about when they were going back to reclaim Jerusalem, how, how, they, how the Hebrews were shocked and amazed. And they said that, lo and behold, the heathen have come up together and changed their, and changed and painted their own images. You know what, actually? I'm going to just go ahead and read it instead of trying to go off my brain because that because that verse directly correlates with what we're reading here in Romans chapter 1 verse 23. So let me get my um, apocryphal Bible real quick and then I'm going to actually read that to you. 
So let's take a look real quick at 1 Maccabees chapter 3, and we're going to start at verse 45. It says, Now Jerusalem lay void as a wilderness. There was none of her children that went in or out. So with, when it says that, that there was none of her children that went in or out, that means there were no Hebrew people, because at this time it was under the rule of King Antiochus. All right. And it says, continue on, it says the sanctuary also was trodden down and aliens kept the stronghold. And when it says aliens there, it doesn't mean aliens from outer space. It means illegal aliens, people who don't belong. Okay. It says the sanctuary also was trodden down and the aliens kept the stronghold. And then it clarifies it in the next verse. It says the heathen had their habitation in that place. So now, um, it's making the scriptures here are making it very clear that that none of her children, none of the Hebrew people were in Jerusalem at this time. It says aliens kept the stronghold, right? Meaning talking about illegal aliens, people who don't belong there. And then it goes on in the next verse to say the heathen. It says the heathen had um had made had made their kept their strong. It said the heathen laid their habitation in that place. And in the next verse, it says, And joy was taken from Jacob, and the pipe with the harp ceased. Talking about, because we know Jacob, he, he fathered the Hebrew Israelites. He fathered the 12 children. You know, Jacob had the, had 12 sons, and they each became um, a tribe of Jerusalem. So that's what they mean. They're talking about the Hebrew Israelite people when it says Jacob, when it says joy was taken away from Jacob with the pipe and the harp ceased. All right. And it says, wherefore, the Israelites assembled themselves together and came to Maspha over against Jerusalem. So now we hear in verse 46, the Israelites came back into Maspha over against Jerusalem so they could take it back. So in this one, it lets us know that the Israelites were somewhere else and now they're coming back to take over Jerusalem, to take Jerusalem back. OK. And, it's, and it says, for in Mespa was the place where they prayed a four time in Israel. So they were in the land of Israel, but they weren't in the city Jerusalem. Okay. It says, then they fasted that day and put on sackcloth and cash ashes upon their heads and rent their clothing. And it says, and laid open. So this is the most important part here. And it says, and laid open. So after they fasted, got all ready, got all in their priestly garments and stuff. It says, then they laid open the book of law, wherein the heathen had sought to paint the likenesses of their images. Okay. So this directly correlates with Romans chapter one, verse 23. So they laid open the good word and they said, and they're like, look at this, the heathen sought to paint the likenesses of their own images. So that is why we see all the white images today. So that is what Romans chapter 1 verse 23 is talking about. Because all these images in the word used to be black people. And that's letting you know that in the original Hebrew scriptures that it was black people. But it says the heathen sought to take up, to, sought to paint their own, sought to paint their own images in the word. So I'll read verse 23 again, and it says, And change the esteem of the incorruptible Elohim into the likeness of, into the likeness, uh, sorry, it says, And change the esteem of the incorruptible Elohim into the likeness of an image of a corruptible man, and of birds, and four-footed beasts, and reptiles. All right, so that is what Yahuwah is talking about. And this is the image that we are dealing with today, okay? The white image. Jesus is back. So that is what they did there. And it says, and so of course, God gave a punishment for this. And of course, this is all relating to the end time prophecy, so we can see how this trend, how this is causing what is the cause of what is the effect of what these Gentiles did. Alright? And so in verse 24, it says, Therefore Elohim gave them up to to uncleanness in the lust of their hearts, to disrespect their bodies among themselves. Who changed the truth of Elohim into a falsehood and worshiped and served what was created rather than the created, 
who is blessed forever. Hallelujah. It says, because of this, Elohim gave them up, gave over. It says, Elohim gave them over to disregarding, degrading passion. Sorry. It says, because of this, Elohim gave them over to degrading passions. For even their women exchanged, exchanged natural relations for what is against nature. And likewise, the men also, having left natural relations with women, burned in their lust for one another, men with men, committing indecency and receiving back the reward which was due for their strain. So listen to this. You wondering, are you catching what Yahuwah did, what he cursed the generations with? If you're not catching that, he just talked about how he gave mankind over into their sexual lust, into sexual lust, like Sodom and Gomorrah. That is what Yahuwah did. He gave us over to the sins of the flesh. So people around here saying, oh, it's animal nature, that men want to have sex and all this stuff. No, 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 that was Yahuwah. That was a command that Yahuwah did on the generations for them, for, you know, for the Catholics, for the um, fake Jews changing Yahuwah's image, okay? So there is a price to pay. So that is where we get homosexuality from. That is Yahuwah's trap. He has trapped the nations in that, and he has put a curse on these generations because people wanted to serve this white image as we're seeing right here. So Yahuwah gave them over. So let me read that again, just in case you didn't fully understand that. It says, because of this, Elohim gave them over to degrading passions, for even their women exchanged natural relations for what is against nature. So it is against nature for a woman and a woman to be together, okay? And it says, and likewise, the men also having left natural relations with women, right? So it says, also the men will, will leave the natural relations with women. And then it goes on and says, burned in their lust for one another, men with men, committing indecency, committing sodomy, in other words, and receiving back the reward which was due for their straying. So because we want to stray away from Yahuwah, Yahuwah says that he will give us over to these undesirable lusts. So this is why we have to try even harder. When you, if you're having a homosexual problem, you need to get out of that because that is Yahuwah's curse that he put on the generation. He made it harder for people to find that salvation because of, because people not wanting to serve the true image of Elohim and tampering with his word. You can't just think that people can twist the scriptures and all that stuff and that Yahuwah isn't going to assign some type of judgment from heaven. And let's continue on. It says, even as they did not think it worthwhile to possess the knowledge of Elohim, Elohim gave them over to a worthless mind to do what is improper, having been filled with all unrighteousness, whoring, wickedness. And I'm going to stop there before I keep reading. It says Elohim gave them over to a worthless mind to do what was improper. So who did it? Elohim. That was not Satan. That was God himself. Saying, I'm going to give you over to a worthless mind because you want to do what you want to do. And you want to serve the white image of Jesus. And you want to use that name and think it's A-OK. So, right, so Elohim gave them over to a worthless mind to do what is improper. Having been filled with all unrighteousness, whoring, wickedness, greed, evil, filled with envy, murder, fighting, deceit, evil habits, whisperers, slanderers. Haters of Elohim, in, insolent, proud, boasters, divisors of evils, disobedient to parents, without discernment, covenant breakers, unloving, unforgiving, ruthless, who, though they, who, though they know the righteousness of Elohim, that, th that, that those who practice such deserve death. Not only do they do not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice with them. Sorry, I read that wrong. It says, who, though they know the righteousness of Elohim, that those who practice such deserve death. 
not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. So are you seeing this laundry list of things that Yahuwah has cursed the generations with? It is amazing that Yahuwah has done. It. And it says in the scriptures that how he speaks into the minds of people to um to do to do things uncovenant. And I'm gonna read that too. That's in Jeremiah chapter six. Let's look at this Jeremiah chapter six, verse sixteen. It says, Thus says Yahuwah, stand in the ways and see and ask for the paths of old, where the good way is, and walk in it, and find rest for yourselves. But they said, We do not walk. Alright, so right here in this first verse here, Yahuwah is telling us to stand in the ways and ask for the old paths, meaning asking for the for asking for the original way Yahuwah set um set apart for man to be before our fall. So Yahuwah is asking us to be holy, asking us to be like the Messiah in righteousness, okay? And his disciples that were righteous. And so that's what this is talking about. It says, Thus said Yahuwah, stand in the ways and see and ask for the old paths, where the good way is. So this is the path to life. The old ways is the path to life. Is the path to life. And walk in it. So he said, don't just ask for it. Walk in it. Do with it. Do the thing. And find rest for yourselves. But they said, we do not walk. So he's telling us to do this. But the generations have said, we will not walk in that path. And Yahuwah says in verse 17, And I raised up watchmen over you. Listen to the sound of the ram's horn. But they said, we do not listen. Meaning, he has given us prophets. He has given us um, people who, who, who stand in the ways of Yahuwah. And he has been sounding the alarm and telling the people to do my cup, be to follow my path and be with me, be righteous. And he, but he says, but then the people are saying, we do not listen. The generations are saying, we ain't going to listen. Right. And that's definitely happening today. It says, we do not listen. Therefore, hear you nations. Right. He's talking to the nation. He says, therefore, hear you nations and know, O congregation, what is upon them. Hear, O earth. See, I am bringing evil upon this people, even the fruit of their thoughts, even the fruit of their thoughts, even the fruit of their thoughts, because they have not listened to my word nor my Torah, and they rejected it, okay? So that is the same thing being said in Romans chapter 1, which Romans chapter 1, verse 16, all the way up to chapter 2. That is the exact same thing being said. So are you seeing how Yahuwah plays mind games with people when you don't keep his commandment? That is very serious. You over here have to worry about the devil, and, you, and now you also want to have to worry about the creator himself deceiving you pushing you into the wrong path because you don't want to keep his Torah. You don't want to keep his commandments. You don't want to listen to the words of the disciples that he left us with and listen to the words of the prophets. So we have to get out of these stiff necked ways, not just the children of Israel, but all Gentiles, all nations. So it don't matter if you white, Asian, don't matter if you're African. It doesn't matter if you're Muslim brown we all need to come over and listen to the words of yahuwah and follow his path okay and that is what we need to be doing and i'm going to make a part two video of this now so i'm going to have to cut this one because as you can see it is over an hour long so i don't want to make it too long so i'm glad and i hope you watch this part one and taking it to heart and stay tuned for part two because it's going to get even better